um, on the what was called the old main road between Hobart and Launceston, the two major cities or towns in, in Hobart, in Tasmania rather, um, we have Green Ponds, which is now known as Kempton. Um, and that's now been bypassed by the highway. And we have here the 1840s congregational um, chapel and congregationalism is a form of, of Methodism. So the Canadian rebels were worshipped here. They were a group of um, Canadian and American political prisoners that were transported to Tasmania for their part in Canadian rebellions between 1837 and 1838. Um, so um, here's where they worshipped and the Reverend Beasley said that he was much pleased by, um, by them. So we have here is again the, what they've, they've what they have actually in a sense imposed on the, the landscape. So here we have a church that was built, the foundations, the early stonework was laid by um, the Canadian um, rebels. So if we go up the highway, we have Tunbridge, and that's be, again been bypassed by the highway, and we have here one of the oldest bridges in Tasmania with um, timber decking. So here's where one of the young islanders, um, Thomas Marr, and another um, young islander um, uh, met. So the young islanders were a group of um, obviously Irish people who had gone, a couple of them, um, one of them, Thomas Marr, the one who met here, had gone to the New Republic and returned with a silk flag that was to be the new Irish flag. Uh, and in 1848, the, 80, the British government found out about the re supposed rebellion and decided to arrest the leaders. There was a revolt and they were transported to Van Diemen's land. So in this um, bridge, the two young islanders met in the middle. They were actually told that they should stick to their own parishes and the bridge was the middle between two parishes so they had food delivered from the local hotel and they met there and had a meal in the middle of the bridge um, so again just like the canadian rebels they were transported for their ideas and if we look down the road in in tunbridge we have the blind Wesleyan chapel. So it's called a blind chapel because it has windows only on one side and the side that is blind is the side that faces towards the hotel. So again, we have that, that influence of Methodism and, you know, and, um, um, and um, congregationalism, those sort of Protestant, quite strict Protestant um, ideas in um, Tasmania. So my final image of Tasmania is George Lovelace's cottage in near Richmond. This isn't actually on the highway, but he was a Wesleyan and Methodist preacher. He, um, in 1833, formed the Friendly Society of Agricultural Labourers. He administered an illegal oath, so you could only administer an oath to the, the king or the queen, and he administered this oath to his fellow agricultural labourers, in other words, trade unionists. And for that, he was transported to um, Tas Tasmania or Van Diemen's land. So they, he was one of the toll puddle martyrs, one of the early trade unionists, um, very early trade unions. Um, he then was pardoned, returned to um, the UK and then migrated, of course, to, to Canada. So again, here we can see the influence of Wesleyism and Methodism, the, the influence of ideas and, the, and what has happened to people who have been, in a sense, um, I suppose, punished for, for their ideas. So if, in all of this running through this is a theme about Wesleyism and Methodism. And that was sort of what started to interest me is this, this role of these ideas that sort of seemingly flowed through all these, these places. Um, so if we turn to the E.P. Thompson, the, the British historian, he wrote quite critically about, um, about Methodism. Um, 
but it and was times quite critical about it in the making of the English working class. So he talked about how um, orthodox Methodism was tried to be imposed on these, these mining villages, on the Durham mining villages, but the villages had their own meanings, expectations and definitions of purpose. So in other words, this, this community had their own, I suppose, sense of ideas and purpose, and it sort of fell on, on fellow ground. And he says as well that one of the reasons, the other reasons that it failed was in effect that there was the dissenting Methodists. And we can see there from what the dissenting Methodists did is this actually resembles very closely the types of activities that trade unions do or should do. So we even have the language of trade unions, conversion, members, people who, <laughs> much to my horror, the language of a trade union in Australia is that if someone joins the union, they're counted as a conversion. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't know whether we want to go, go there anymore. But anyway, um, um, and I suppose um, my own union, the National Tertiary Education Union, like many unions in Australia, has adopted over, uh, over the last, I suppose, 20, 30 years, the organising approach. So these approaches that have come from the US um, and is now enthralled by the ideas of Jane McElhaney um, and the ideas of, of deep organising. Um, so in some ways, um, I suppose my argument is, is that these types of organising, like people like as Sims and Holgate talk about, is means that it's becomes these trade unionism in effect has become strict of its politics. It becomes this series of, of activities. Um, and so in this, the emphasis is on action rather than ideas. Um, so in, in a sense, I think what it seems to me often is that what happens in Australia at least is that people um, join unions, they're often in workplaces with low density and um, they sort of then think, well, you know, why have I joined this union? What's the purpose of this union? It's not really in some ways all that apparent they might join because other people have joined or they think you know if they get in a spot of bother in the workplace it will help them individually but I just think there's often not this idea um, about what um, they expect from the union or or conversely the union's expectations of of them <clears throat> um, so for my sins I'm now um, the secretary of the Tasmanian division of the NTU. <laughs> Five minutes, David. Gosh. Um, so this has given me, I suppose, in a sense, the opportunity to observe. Um, I've only been there for four months, so I've sat back and watched what's gone on in my division, which isn't very big. But anyway, so it's given me an opportunity to observe what happens. Um, and I see a lot of activity in my union, um, but in we, and in some ways, an understandable emphasis on action. So we're in bargaining at the moment. And what actually has been happening is that the, all, they talk about, the organiser and the industrial officer talk about the ladder of, um, what's it called? The ladder of engagement. So this is taken from the Obama campaign. It starts off with people clicking on Facebook likes or something, and then it's meant to go up the ladder of engagement till next thing they're standing on picket lines. I mean, I have just been standing back, I must admit, and um, rolling my eyes. But anyway, it assumes that um, people understand what the union's about and its ideas and what it represents. And it's got me a little bit interested in, talk, in looking at the public face of unions. And here we've got something from an, another union, the Australian Nurses and Mid Midwifery um, Federation, and it talks there about um, the collective voice. So we've got things about voice, which is fine. And it talks about, I suppose, implicitly strength by 310,000 people. And then it talks about nurses, midwives, and carers. But there's in, it seems to be not really a lot there about what actually the union is or what it does or what it actually stands for. Um, so, I started to read a little bit deeper into some 
people <coughs> talking about um, what happens in, in workplaces. And I sort of was interested in the idea that perhaps in some ways you can think of workplaces as being a bit like the Durham mining village of um, um, that E.P. Thompson talked about. So um, Hay writing about um, a closed pulp and paper factory in Northwest Tasmania talked about workers in factories generate an endless trove of stories. So about workers having stories about their own workplace. And, you know, if, we're, if you're in the workplace, you know that you do have your own sort of norms and purpose, and they're quite different in a sense to what, to what management has. Um, and you know, in the sense, they have their own shared vocabularies too. He's written a book of poetry in the language of um, these pulp and paper workers. Um, so, but I'd understand, I suppose in a sense, I'd, say that perhaps, um, well, Quinlan as well, right in um, from a historical perspective, makes the, the idea or puts forward the idea that um, we could, union understandings didn't find their way into union records because they're so well understood that they would seem to have no need to record them. So in other words, that these were implicit in people's understanding, but it would seem to me, or I'd wonder whether in the modern workplace where it's, you know, it's, efficient workplace with um, lots of casual employment and things like that, that in fact, um, and low density that these understandings are weak. So unions do need to tell their own stories too. Yep. Um, so everyone echoes E.P. Thompson and argues that ideas need to be reinserted into accounts of mobilisation. So while material circumstances might provide fertile ground for mobilisation. It's in some sense, um, narrative stories and ideas that provide the impetus. So Levesque and Murray look at the actor level and argue that unions have narrative resources um, that comprise stories, values, and ideologies that translate and inform motives. So he, they say that actors need to assign um, meaning to material conditions and interpret them in ways that breach the different concerns of uh, groups and, and um, mobilise them. So again, you know, uh, Refslund and Arnold's, they also talk about ideas. So, but when I look at my union, I suspect many other unions, there don't seem to be stories that unions tell about themselves. Um, and they don't seem to have any these stories and they don't seem to have, you know, values or ideologies or, or things like that. They sort of, in a sense, content Free. There's a lot of activity, but not a lot of, of content. So um, the industrial officer and the organiser in my union, they talk about um, educating members to take um, action. But that's not about giving members ideas about why they would want to take action, but in a sense, almost like action be getting action. Be getting action. Um, so the stories that the union my union does tell is about management being bastards. Now that's undoubtedly true, but that's a story about management. That's not a story about the union. Um, I'm in the home stretch, David. <laughs> so if we look at the side of management, management have corporate culture, you know, they have organizational development, they the, you know, they're named. Organ they name themselves people and culture, you know, they have myths and they have stories and they have all this sort of stuff that goes um, like that. Um, when they go into disputes, they have their media strategy, they prevent people from, um, workers from telling their stories to um, um, the, the press and, you know, even things like symbols of scabs, they're now in Australia, you can't, um, um, you can't inflate scabby outside um, the factory gates because that's seen as, I don't know, bullying people or, or something like that. Um, so what, a, in a sense, um, my argument in a sense is that uh, unions have replaced ideas with action. Um, and in times I've heard ideas uh, about talk about the creation of a union culture, but that's, we don't even seem to talk about that any longer. Um, Raymond Williams, talking about the 1926 strike, he talks about how it's um, 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 hard work. And he talks, though, about 
he talks about consciousness in a, in a, in a sense. Um, so in a sense, what I say is that unions need to talk more about ideas. Um, perhaps I'm too pessimistic and I'd happy, be happy to be um, contradicted. I'd like, I think I'm planning to go out there and do some field work and I'm just not quite sure how I do it. But anyway, um, that's, <laughs> that's me all finished. <laughs>